I think it points to the fact of how the party system just breaks brains. It absolutely takes away people's feelings of needing to think for themselves, to research for themselves, and instead they just sort of hand over their brain capacity to whichever party they've decided to lump themselves in with, and they go along with whatever that party's telling them at a given time. Hey guys, welcome back to the Base Politics Podcast. This week, freedom of speech is in trouble. Free the whales and slap lawsuits. The White House is gaslighting us on Bidenomics yet again. And just how behind our school kids? Let's get into it. You and I have to talk about this new poll from Real Clear Politics that dived into uh, a survey of Americans and asked them for their thoughts about free speech and the First Amendment. And this was a really interesting survey because at first I kind of got my hopes up because of this top line finding. So uh, listen to this, Hannah. A whopping nine in 10 respondents say that the Constitution's First Amendment protections for free speech are a good thing with just 9% of people saying they're a bad thing. Surface level, that sounds pretty good. Sounds pretty good. But I have I always have two thoughts when I approach polling information. And one is just who was actually asked? How big was the sample size? You know, they can get polls to say a lot of things just by how they phrase questions, where they go to ask the questions. So that's always my first bit of interest. And then secondarily, what you find is that people often really like buzzwords that they don't know the meaning of. So or they hate buzzwords that they don't know the meaning of. Right. So if you ask people their opinions on capitalism, a lot of people would say, they don't like it. But if you ask people if they should be able to buy and sell goods without interference, they would mostly say that's a good thing. So I guess I'm curious right off the bat with this one, when people say they like free speech, you know, I think people by that, I assume having dealt with a lot of people on the subject mean they like their ability to have freedom of speech, but they don't necessarily like it when other people have freedom of speech. Yeah, unfortunately, that is the truth that was revealed by the more in-depth questions in this survey. So uh, what they essentially seem to believe, a majority of Americans think that free speech is a good thing, just not for those icky people, those people I don't like. So some of the survey questions asked, um, should the KKK have First Amendment free speech rights? 58% of Americans said no, that the First Amendment should not apply to the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, similarly, 58% also said that the right to free speech should not extend to the Nazi party, and 55% said the same about the Communist Party. Now, of course, you and I think all three of these groups are horrible and disgusting, uh, but free speech doesn't work like this. You can't have free, you can't say I support free speech, but not for X, Y, and Z icky people. Right. Because that's so inherently su su subjective. So many people think your speech is hateful or on, uh, on an, a given issue. Both sides think the other's position is hate speech. And so even if almost everybody can agree that Nazis are bad, we can't all agree on who is a Nazi or not. I mean, that is thrown around like candy on Halloween these days. So if you open that door a crack politicians and the government will bang it wide open. So you really do have to have a black and white approach. All speech, not some is hate speech. All speech is protected by the First Amendment uh, in this context. Right. Well, to be clear, there is no need to protect popular speech. Free speech is needed to protect speech that is inherently unpopular and that many people have disdain for. And that is so important because it's never going to you're not going to lose your freedoms on the grounds that you think you're going to lose them on. It happens chip by chip, legal precedent by legal precedent. The more you chip away at the freedom of other people, you start to build a foundation to where eventually they can come after you and popular speech and normal things. But it starts on the margins. And I think that people on both the left and right used to understand that. That's why you saw groups like the ACLU who would actually defend Nazis in the courts because they recognize that you had to fight when it first starts. They're going to go after unpopular, icky, disgusting people, which Nazis absolutely are. But if you allow them to get you to throw away your rights to go after a bad person, you ultimately give them the power to come after good people. And so it is interesting to me. And it's interesting because I, I'm, I guess maybe you have this information, Brad, if they broke this down and 
data on who the respondents were. But if you talk to people in some of these communities that have been targeted, especially amongst like the Jewish community, there's a lot of people who used to really get this and still do and who say like, no, we have, don't use us as an excuse to chip away at civil liberties, right? These groups are awful and we can beat them on their face and they are increasingly shrinking and marginalized in society, but don't use you know their hatred of us to come in and chip away at the constitution or civil liberties because they understand how those things unfold. Some of them have escaped oppressive regimes that have come after all free speech, all the ability to defend yourself. But if you notice, you know, when we're talking about civil liberties, we're never having these conversations on popular around popular people. It's always with abhorrent, disgusting people. You know, the same thing if you talk about the death penalty. We're not going to talk about the people that get wrongfully accused or the person who was severely mentally ill and sent to death row. We're going to talk about Ted Bundy. You know, we're always yeah. going to talk about things in the most extremes. And so it makes it really easy for people to say, well, yeah, throw that guy out with the bathwater. And they just they don't think a couple steps ahead. Yeah. So in terms of the breakdowns, this wasn't broken down by race, but what it was broken down by uh, was party affiliation. And unfortunately, on almost all of the questions asked, Democrats were significantly more likely to support free speech or censorship than Republicans, but also like Republicans more than I expected. Well, to be honest, I kind of did expect this because I've seen these polls in the past. More than one might expect were OK with censorship, but there was still a clear partisan divide where Democrats were much more likely to support different forms of censorship than the Republicans were. And the second topic, so it talked about the, the hate speech thing, which is completely unworkable for the reasons we discussed. But the second topic was, and some that we've discussed at length on this show, the government's role in censoring misinformation in the name of national security. So 40% said that it's more important that the government can censor users or content on social media platforms that it feels threatens national security than it is that people can post what they think is in the nation's best interest. There's also a partisan split on this question because uh, basically a majority of Democrats, 52%, in, in support censoring social media content in the name of protecting national security, but among Republicans, it's only one third. So uh, just to me, it's really disturbing because did these folks not live through the things that you and I have lived through? Because I have seen national throughout my lifetime, right? In the post 9-11 era, I've seen Patriot Act powers that were supposed to only be used on terrorists, used to surveil and spy on everyday Americans and to end up mostly being used uh, to wage the drug war, which was not what they were passed for. I've seen uh, temporary emergency measures in the name of COVID last for years and end up being applied in all sorts of inane ways. I've seen the government trying to take down individual jokes that people posted on Twitter. Uh, and so I, I think this idea that, well, they need to be able to take things down in the name of national security. One, it, it assumes too much that, that the government would ever actually just not stretch that definition of national security to include almost anything they don't like. I mean, so they would say that hate speech is a threat to national security because white supremacist domestic terrorism is a top issue. And to be fair, like there have been terrible shootings by white supremacist mass, uh, mass shooters, but they would say you could extrapolate almost any category of speech to somehow endanger national security in some vague and abstract way. So if you give the government that power or you let it grab that power, which it's been trying to do without being given it, uh, it's never going to stay contained to some like narrow, oh, they're just going to go after ISIS propaganda. No, they're going to end up going over, uh, going after your Uncle Bob posting memes on Facebook. Well, in fact, we absolutely know that's exactly what they did from some of the leaks that we've obtained from Facebook and from Twitter. They were saying that posts making fun of vaccine mandates, literal memes, were a threat to national security. They were saying that people who were pushing back on a variation of COVID policies were a threat to national security, a threat to public health. We've already seen them do these kinds of things and say this kind of stuff. So it's really annoying to me that people don't think, again, a little bit further. And it is interesting to see the flip because back in the early 2000s, when, you know, for the first time in my life, I began hearing these conversations after 9-11, it was Republicans pushing this whole agenda and saying, 
you know, in the vein of national security, we need to have FISA courts and we need the Patriot Act and we need we need the Department of Homeland Security and we need all these new warrantless spying and people just handed it to them carte blanche, really. But you did have more Democrats that were fighting for, for civil liberties at that point and pushing back on some of this Democrats like Barbara Lee and others. Um, and now you see this flipping. And it, I think it points to the fact of how the party system just breaks brains. It absolutely takes away people's feelings of needing to think for themselves, to research for themselves. And instead, they just sort of hand over their brain capacity to whichever party they've decided to lump themselves in with. And they go along with whatever that party's telling them at a given time. So now you have the Democrats saying there's national security issues with Russia Gate and people influencing elections. And we need to make sure that there's an fake information online that could sway things against us and their voters are going along with it, you know, hand over fist. So it's very, it's, it's, I don't know, I guess it's one of those things where it's human nature almost at this point. You have to accept that people are largely sheep, that they're easily misled, that they're easily fear mongered. And if you tell people that they're in danger, a lot of people will absolutely hand over their rights with no further questions asked. And I I think that it's important for people like us to remember, and I think most people in our audience would likely fall into this camp. We really want to be free. We really care about liberty. We feel strongly that we want the right to pursue life and to reap the benefits of our choices and and face the consequences of the choices when we make bad ones. But I think we are in the minority. I don't think most people actually want to be free. They want to feel safe. They want to feel taken care of. And they don't really have that like gumption that many of us share. And so um, I think that it's people like us who preserve rights for all of those people too. you know, will fight for them even when they don't have the guts or the, um, you know, IQ, I guess, to fight for themselves. They're not really very uh, smart or very at least very knowledgeable of how bad things can get as you hand things over, especially in America. People have led very cushy lives for, you know, over 200 years now. So they're pretty far removed from these brutal dictatorships from these really oppressive regimes. And I think to many people, it feels like we'd never end up there, but they they lack a historical context and understanding of how quickly that can progress in a country, how quickly freedoms really can be lost. So I do believe in Americans' ability to judge this stuff for themselves. I think underlying a lot of the censorship uh, push is this fundamental contempt for the everyday Americans' ability to sort fact from fiction or to decide on their own. Uh, And so I think, you know, let the dubious memes or the failed fact check posts, let them circulate on the Internet. And I support decentralized ways of countering misinformation. Community notes on Twitter where users append fact checks to posts is a great example of that. And then counter information. But I what I don't believe in, what I wish people could see why it was so misguided is allowing the government to be the arbiter of truth and falsehood in the name of policing misinformation that threatens national security. I mean, we've seen them be time and time again be wrong about basic things. They changed their position on masks. They said it was a conspiracy theory, that it was possibly a lab leak. Now it's many consider it a probable outcome. So the idea that we're going to hand over detached government bureaucrats the power to declare one truth that must then be observed and enforced on social media by that government is not just Orwellian, but it's incredibly short-sighted and it assumes far too much competence on behalf of our government that has repeatedly uh, not earned that level of confidence. So I hope people can wake up, they can realize that there's no such thing as only banning speech for the bad guys or there's no such thing as benevolent censorship to fight misinformation, all these things can and will be abused to ultimately undermine your own liberties and freedoms. So be careful what you wish for. And lastly, I do want to point out that while this poll showed Democrats having more of that attitude than Republicans on the ground, we are seeing a lot of Republican lawmakers who are basically doing the same thing. They've made the bad guy big tech and they're fighting over restricting the free speech rights of the tech companies and their business owners and going after things like Section 230 and then passing bills like we've seen in Florida and also in Texas over the past year, where these bills, they are saying that they want to prevent social media companies from censoring conservative views. But the way that they're structured, what they actually do is give the government the power to tell social media companies how to moderate their content, which is a violation of free speech, which is also censorship. And so it's really important that you don't get tricked on either side, because while I think 
you do have more respect for free speech on the right than the left right now. There are still very concerning pieces of legislation and just ideology floating around on both sides. So you have to be on guard against this stuff. Enjoying this episode of the Base Politics Podcast and looking for like-minded thinkers? Look no further than She Thinks, a podcast production from the Independent Women's Forum. Every Friday morning, host Beverly Hauberg is joined by policymakers and thought leaders who cut through the clutter and bring you information on the issues that matter most. From the economy and education to censorship and comedy, trad wives, and everything in between, She Thinks has got you covered. Hear from guests like Seth Dillon of the Babylon Bee, Amala Ekpanobi, John McEntee, and even yours truly, Hannah Cox from Base Politics. Can't wait for the next episode to drop? You can search for past episodes at iwf.org or search She Thinks on your favorite podcast app. Okay, well, next up, I want to keep our attention in Florida, since I just mentioned it. And I want to talk about a wildlife uh, zoo-type facility there called the Miami Sea Aquarium. This is sort of a knockoff sea world, as best I understand it, and from the videos I've watched and obtained. But they have come under major fire recently as activists. And even members of Congress have become increasingly worried about the conditions that they are keeping their orcas and their dolphins. And I came across the story of the weekend. I think most people know I am, I guess, sort of an animal rights activist. I, I really care a lot about the ethical treatment of animals. I think that as free market capitalists, it is our duty to take care of the world and animals around us. I have had a staunch opposition to most zoos and aquariums for some time. Not that I think they should be outlawed or banned, but a lot of them get public funding, corporate welfare. I'm very opposed to that. And I don't personally visit them or give them my money because I just don't think that that's really what we should be doing with animals. There are some research facilities that I think are important, and there are definitely some sanctuaries who take in injured animals or animals that have been kept in captivity. I would support those types of facilities, but by and large, I don't. So a just disclaimer there before I get into the story. But I came across a tweet that said a concerned citizen called the Miami Sea Aquarium to ask about the fate of Leahy, an elderly dolphin that was living in solitary confinement and in an ever deteriorating condition. The answer this caller received was telling. We're gonna roll this recorded video. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, we actually have video of the conditions the dolphin was living in, but if you're on audio, we'll play the recorded call. Hello, Miami's Aquarium, I'm gonna help you. Uh, yeah, I'm just calling about the dolphin you guys have in the dirty tank. You guys have already killed the orca and I'm trying to see if what your plan is with this dolphin or can I have him and set him free? I'm sorry? The dolphin? You know, the one in your tank that's shut down? Hello, my name is Cardi, I'm gonna help you. Hi, I called a few minutes ago. I was trying to talk to someone about Lee. I'm just wondering what's going on with it. If you like any updates or anything like that, you can just follow our social media. Well, so I was, we do give you guys don't really post about it on social media. It's kind of hidden in your closed off area, but. Um. So, I mean, look, that guy clearly was calling in a little bit of a hostile way, but that wasn't exactly great a customer service. <laughs> Well, what were your thoughts on the video? Can you describe it for people who can't see this? Yeah, uh, the, so it's drone footage of this closed off um, exhibit and the water looks dirty and the walls look dirty and the dolphin is just going around and around and it looks kind of alone. I, I Hard to tell because I'm not really familiar with what that should look like um, or the when that's only, you know, a 60 second clip or whatever. But it doesn't look great. It looks abandoned, right? I mean, that was my first thought. Is this looks yeah, like it kind of does. Yeah. Stadium. Yeah. It looks completely deteriorated and the tank is filthy and it's just it looks like uh, it got trapped in like a trash zone, honestly. So um, the video was obtained by a man named Phil Demers. He's the co-founder of something called Urgent Seas. And they say on their website, they're a whistleblower organization exposing zoos and aquariums through direct action and advocacy. And they appear to have been working to raise awareness about this particular facility for some time. They actually spent a great deal of time sounding the alarm on the conditions that the Miami Sea Aquarium was keeping a 57-year-old orca in. Her name was Lolita. And Lahi, the Pacific white-sided dolphin in question that we see in this video, was actually a tank companion to Lolita until the whale died 
in August. Now, the whale, Lolita, had been in captivity for 53 of its 57 years, and they say that she died from an apparent renal condition. Now, according to reporting from the Associated Press, animal rights activists have been fighting for years to have Lolita freed from her tank at the sea aquarium. The park's relatively new owner, the Dolphin Company, and the nonprofit Friends of Toki, which was her uh, Japanese name, I believe, announced a plan in March to possibly move her to a natural sea pen in the Pacific Northwest with the financial backing of Indianapolis Colts owner Jim Ursi. Well, Lita retired from performing last spring as a condition of the park's new exhibitor's license with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. She had not been publicly displayed since. In recent months, new upgrades have been installed to better filter the pool and regulate the water temperature. Federal and state regulators would have had to approve any plan to move Lolita, and that could have taken months or years. So the 5,000-pound orca had been living for years in a tank that measured 80 feet by 35 feet and was only 20 feet deep. Her enclosure at the Miami Sea Aquarium had undergone renovations in the past year, but the tank sits inside a stadium that is under a repair or demolish order from the Miami-Dade County. Now, Yay. Can, yeah. So activists have obviously been quite concerned for some time. They've been working to raise awareness about this facility. And it got to the point where Congress actually started to get involved. A number of congressional leaders sent some uh, letters wanting to find out more information about these conditions. A few years ago, Congresswoman Susan Delbean and her colleagues um, said they were particularly concerned given damage that was seen following Hurricane Irma during the 2017 season. And she wrote, not only did the storm appear to turn the tank water murky, upon the return of the park, her caretakers found the whale's tank to be full of debris. While she endured then, she may not be so lucky the next time. This was in 2017. So, of course, um, the whale did not end up being so lucky. It did pass. It passed before it was able to be moved. And this led to even greater public outcry and then more attention, of course, on the dolphin that was left all alone in the solitary tank once Lolita passed. Um, now, this blew up over the weekend. I saw a ton of people commenting on it, really big names on Twitter were calling out the facility. They were also calling out the mayor of Miami. Um, I encourage people to file better business complaints with this facility. So after tremendous backlash online, the Miami Sea Aquarium Man has announced that he has been moved to SeaWorld San Antonio, where they say he will live out the rest of his life with others of his species. So I am no fan of SeaWorld. I've actually been, uh, I saw the documentary Blackfish a number of years ago, focusing on SeaWorld's own ethical problems with how they treat their whales and other animals in their care. So it's pretty bleak to me when a, a SeaWorld facility is the better alternative, but I guess in this circumstance, that does appear to be the case. So it is, I guess I want to pause. There's a lot more to the story we have to get into, but I kind of want to flush out, I guess, and give you time to sort of give your thoughts on just animal captivity in general and, you know, whether or not these kinds of facilities should be legal. What are your thoughts? You know, I, I don't have strong feelings. I feel like I don't know a lot about it. So it, it's kind of hard for me to come down on, on either way here when I just don't know a lot about the science of this, about the different standards and how uh, just what it does to animals to be in captivity what versus the wild. Uh, I, yeah, I feel like I'm just too uninformed to come in and just have a hot take immediately. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I've often struggled with these questions, right? Because I'm not a vegan. I do think that there are reasons for why we have to kill animals at times. And I think that when we do it, it needs to be done ethically. And we need to make sure that we are using all parts of the animal to the best of our ability. And so I accept a certain level of um, what feels like ethical murkiness to me. Um, as far as our food sourcing. And, and I obviously have many issues with big ag and our practices under that as well. But kind of, you know, to take it to a principle versus policy standpoint, that's where I fall on the line. When it comes to animal captivity, though, where we are imprisoning animals just for our own enjoyment and particularly to make money off of, this is where I don't really feel as much ambiguity. I think that we don't really have a good excuse to be doing this. I guess where I... I have a little bit of a gray area as I don't know to what extent I want the government involved in that. I think it can probably be handled for the most part by the market and people just choosing to not give these kinds of companies and facilities your money. Pay to go out on a boat in the ocean if you want to see whales, right? Like don't spend money to go to these kinds of places and 
and give them the funds to keep doing this. I think I am probably okay with laws that restrict them from capturing um, many kinds of animals, particularly mammals. And when you get into like dolphins and orcas, these are animals that one, travel tons of miles every day. I mean, their their lives, they're all over the ocean. So keeping them in an 85 by 35 foot like encapsulation in a tank and it's only 20 foot deep, that to me is disgusting. I don't think that that is any quality of life for those animals and particularly orcas. I know less about dolphins, but orcas are very, very smart. They live in family pods their entire life. They actually have their own language where they can communicate. And so isolating them, not only from their families, but just from any other um, animals around them is cruel and inhumane. So I, I really just have such a distaste for these kinds of facilities. And I love to see activists who are raising the alarm on it and just working to educate people because I used to not be as informed on this until I saw Blackfish. And that really put me on a journey of researching a lot more into this and, and really kind of changed my attitude on many of these kinds of facilities. So that's where I fall on this issue. But my bigger issue in this story is what I found when I kept digging after they announced that they were transferring. The dolphin, I had been championing this uh, activist work and, and sharing some of the video that he had of this facility. And I noticed that in the comments, he had linked a GoFundMe and said that he was actually being sued by the Miami Sea Aquarium. And so this really piqued my interest. Um, I started looking into that. And I found research that says, according to a lawsuit filed in Miami-Dade County, the Miami Sea Aquarium alleges that Phil Demers has used misinformation and intimidation tactics to interfere with zoos in an attempt to rescue animals from unsafe conditions. The lawsuit claims that Demers has used drones to record unauthorized images and that he's knowingly published false information. Now, on his GoFundMe, he said, hi, everyone, I've just been served with a lawsuit by the Miami Sea Aquarium for allegedly flying a drone and publishing videos of their isolated orca Lolita. I believe this to be a slap, S-L-A-P-P, -P, lawsuit intent on silencing my activism as I've been a vocal critic of the park on my social media platforms. Urgent Seas and Walrus Whisperer and I look forward to defending myself and will not let them silence me. Your support is greatly appreciated. Much love, Phil. And it noted that he has raised 37000 of his $40,000 goal. Full disclosure, I did donate to him. I then got really mad about this once I came across it because I hate slap lawsuits, Brad. Yeah, Do can you, you just go over what that, what that is again for folks? Yes, I absolutely can. And in fact, I have some um, clips from an old John Oliver episode that I want to roll where he actually talked about his own experience where he was sued by the CEO of a company called Murray Energy, which is a coal company, Bob Murray. And this was a very infamous slap lawsuit that got national attention. And he ended up doing a whole segment on this problem. But just a quick summary, um, slap, S-L-A-A-P lawsuits. They stand for strategic lawsuits against public participation. And they are lawsuits that are intended to censor intimidate and silence critics by burdening them with the cost of a legal defense until they abandon their criticism or opposition. They often target journalists and members of the media, but they also can be used to go after activists, protesters, and other public figures to entangle them in endless legal proceedings that are, again, they're meant to silence their voices. They're frivolous lawsuits. They're used by really wealthy and powerful com companies and corporations, often to intimidate those who are speaking out against them. And they don't mean to win. OK, like that's what you really need to understand about these lawsuits is that they don't really have the grounds they need to win. They file them so that they can intimidate the people they are suing and also um, wrap them up with legal fees that they often can't afford. So I'm going to play a few different segments from this John Oliver clip. Let's watch the first one now. Actually get to the key characteristic of slap suits. The whole point is to put the defendant through a difficult, painful experience. And even if cases fail in lower courts, as they often do, the plaintiffs can find ways to extend them through intensive discovery requests, depositions, and appeals that drain the target's time and resources. And alarmingly, journalists are not the only ones targeted with slap suits. In some cases, they can be used to silence citizen activists. Take the residents of Uniontown, Alabama. After a waste disposal company agreed to store toxic coal ash in a landfill near their homes, some members of a local group posted about their concerns on their Facebook page. But in 2016, the company behind the landfill sued four members of the group for $30 million. 
which is a ridiculous amount to sue anyone for, let alone people living in a community where the median household income is just $14,000. Although, to be fair, the attorney representing the landfill claimed that that $30 million figure wasn't actually as bad as it sounds. It has scared a lot of people in this area for speaking up because those individuals are afraid to get their backlash not knowing that that's just a scare tactic to get you to leave things alone so they can continue their power and control to do what they want to do. Yeah. She's exactly right. But the problem with scare tactics is that they work. Because things that could hurt you are scary. So basically, these are just lawsuits that are weaponized to try to get people to, to shut up and go away. Yeah, and they're very effective. I used to work with some free speech attorneys in Nashville, and they were frequently having to defend people from this kind of thing. I remember one case, someone in town in Nashville, Tennessee, had left a bad review on a local business. I think it was a restaurant and they sued them. They literally sued them. And then this person was going to have to try to gather the money to defend themselves. So remember, guys, in America's legal system, this is a really bad structure. Most countries don't do it this way. But in America's legal community, if you are sued, you have to come up with the money to defend yourself, even if you're in the right. And even if you win, you often don't get that money back. So you are looking at what could be tens of thousands to even hundreds of thousands of dollars to have to defend yourself out of the blue, again, just because of something that you said. Now, not only is this, I think, an intimidation tactic and used to suppress free speech and shut down protests, it's also something that really clogs up our court system. Our court system is overrun. Quick reminder, most people can't even get a trial in America anymore, right? Like 95 to 99% of cases are pled out. That's how many cases are circulating at a given time. So when you add this to the mix, it is something that is slowing down our system. It's costing taxpayers resources, and it means that many other people aren't getting justice while these things clog up the system. So I have a huge problem with them, but I think they are a tremendous threat to free speech. I want to roll the second clip from John Oliver. The thing is, pretty much everyone, from judges to legal scholars, agrees that slap suits are a scourge. That is why 30 states have some form of anti-slap laws, which vary significantly, but broadly can enable defendants to force plaintiffs to justify their claim early on. And if they can't do that, the case is not only dismissed, but in some states, the defendant is then awarded attorney's fees. Now, when they are well-crafted, these laws can strike an important balance between protecting legitimate claims and deterring time-wasting bullshit. The problem is, 20 states don't have those laws. And with no federal anti-slap legislation, plaintiffs can simply file a suit in one of those states, one of which is West Virginia. And that is actually where Bob Murray sued us, despite the fact that neither he nor I live there. Now, to be clear, there are 33 states and the District of Columbia which have passed laws regulating slap lawsuits, but they're kind of a hodgepodge. In some states, they only pertain to certain professions, like if you're a member of the government, you can't have a slap lawsuit filed against you. In other states, they'll pertain to things like real estate or insurance. And as a whole, we just don't have a uniform standard. So this lawsuit was filed in Florida, which actually is one of the 33 states that has an anti-slap law on the books, but in my opinion, it's one of the ones that doesn't go far enough. Uh, according to my research, they say under Florida's journal anti-slap law, a defendant can file a motion to dismiss for summary judgment, which the court will hear at its earliest possible time. But Florida's anti-slap laws are two of only a handful that do not address whether a slap defendant's motion will halt discovery proceedings. So essentially, they can try to get in front of a judge much more expediently than you could otherwise, and perhaps the judge will take action, but there's no guarantee and discovery might still proceed, which is the very, very expensive component of a trial. So just because Florida has this on the books, first and foremost, doesn't mean that it actually protects people as robustly as they need to be protected from these things. It also doesn't mean that the judge will see things in the right light if it is a slap lawsuit. So this is why we need a federal law. We need it to be uniform, not only for the reasons I just mentioned, but also because of the fact that even if you live in one of the states that has some kind of regulation on the books around SLAP, somebody can just sue you in another state. You and the person suing you don't even have to live in the state where the lawsuit is filed, so they could just go somewhere else and file it. That's actually what happened 
to John Oliver, he was um, sued in West Virginia, even though neither he or the person suing him had anything to do with that state. So this is why we do need a federal lawsuit to protect people. Okay, but one one question. We don't know for sure that this is a slap lawsuit. That's his claim. But if, yes, but if there what is they're no... alleging is true, that he knowingly lied, which I have no reason to believe, but if that was true, then that would be a serious case, not a slap lawsuit. That would be correct. But the way you can kind of tell what is a slap lawsuit and what isn't is on the grounds that they're filing it. And as he mentions in this clip, those states that have crafted their regulations really well when they're making anti-slap lawsuits, it's done in such a way so that you can more quickly ascertain whether or not somebody actually has grounds to sue you on. Whereas right now, the way it would proceed is somebody sues you, you have to then go through discovery where you're gathering a ton of evidence that takes a lot of time, that takes a lot of money to pay a lawyer. And then down the road, you get to whether or not you're going to proceed. That could still be months of litigation. When you have a good anti-slap lawsuit, that makes basically says the court has to review it faster for grounds that it could be a slap lawsuit, which would essentially just mean that they are suing you based on your speech and there is no solid grounds for it. And with this guy, even in their statement, what they are trying to allege is mostly about his speech, right? They do mention him flying some drones and not having um, permission to take photos of their facility. But I went into the legal statute on that to see if he actually broke the law in doing this. And what I found is that in the U.S., airspace is generally considered a public highway and the airspace overhead of a property is part of the public domain. They do say if a landowner is to have full enjoyment of their land, they must have exclusive control of the immediate reaches of the enveloping atmosphere. So basically, that means a landowner is protected against intrusions in the airspace that would like immediately or directly subtract from their full enjoyment of the property and to limit their exploitation of it. So I think it would be really hard to argue that flying a drone over somebody's property crossed that ground. It's not exactly a fixed right. These things can be arbitrated in court. And I'm sure you could maybe make some um, arguments. Like if you had a, I was thinking about a comparison. If you have like an NFL stadium and somebody flies a drone over it while they're practicing, I would think that that could be a concern for them because then their plays could get out. Right. And so you could argue that this is harming their ability to fully use their property in the way that they need to. I don't really see what grounds they could argue that for flying a drone over a tank and taking pictures. Um, secondarily in Florida, I looked into the laws around drones specifically, and they do have a law that prohibits the use of a drone to capture images of privately owned property, um, or the owner, tenant, or occupant of the property without the consent if a reasonable expectation of privacy exists. Now- And that's the key part, right? Because it's pretty hard to claim that a aquarium, a public space, has a reasonable expectation of privacy. Exactly. I don't think that they would have that grounds. So like if they were going, if they were sending a drone into your backyard and having it look down through your sunroof into like your house or something, you would have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Or even if you had like a fenced off pool that was in public, that was not in public, but that that a drone over top could see and it was out, but you have a fence. So you're, you know, and it's on your land. So when you're partying at the pool, you assume there's some privacy. Mm -hmm. A park is not private. I mean, you could buy a ticket and fly a drone. There's no reasonable expectation of privacy or not having photos taken of your facility. I just, I don't buy it. If I was on that jury, you would not be able to convince me of that. So, I mean, but again, go back to their tactics for, or their sentence rather for why they say they're suing him. And it really is more to do with what they say is quote, quote, misinformation and intimidation tactics. That's not intimidation to literally sound the alarm on what you're doing, right? If he's threatening you, if he's in some way like trying to shake you down, that would maybe be grounds for that. But to me, this is literally, I think it reads like a slap lawsuit. They're mad about his speech. He's done nothing really but produce videos and facts that he can obtain about the conditions these animals are in. There's nothing that they've been able to produce to push back or say he's like editing these images or trying to misconstrue the conditions these animals are in. And in fact, by sending the dolphin to the SeaWorld location pretty expediently after the backlash, I think that's kind of an admission that they knew things weren't going great inside. So I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I'm not going to try to litigate the lawsuit here. And I can't say for sure if it's a slap lawsuit because I don't have all of the information. But the point is that we should have a federal statute that ensures when somebody does file a slap lawsuit, one, 
It's very quickly to ascertain that it gets thrown out and that the other person who has filed it has to pay damages, right? I think that's important. If you were going around frivolously suing people, you should have to pay for that at the end of the day. That should be on you. That should not be up in the air and just something that's decided down the line. Now, the one thing I did see is he got in a bit of a spat with the newer owner of this facility where he's basically saying the man responsible for the care of this um, animal is Eduardo Albar, and he tagged him on Twitter, and he said he must be held accountable for uh, her torturous existence. And Eduardo actually responded to him and said, you are vicious and a pervert being, not human, not animal. Knowing my company just took responsibility of the Miami Sea Aquarium in April last year and then began taking actions and creating options for Lolita first time ever, and you still say, I must be held responsible for the 50 years of torture. I thought that was a really interesting exchange because one, you're admitting that she was tortured for 50 years. Um, and two, that I think he has a bit of a point. You know, if he did just take over the facility and was trying to make things better, you know, calling him out and, and blaming him for the whole history of this place is, is, is not really fair. So that's the only thing I really saw where I was like, mm, he might have a little bit of a point here. But I think moreover, um, this is why we just need a better protection for people in general in the court system and to protect free speech and activism. Because again, even when you win, this can be very detrimental. I want to roll this last clip from John Oliver about his own experience. His lawsuits can do major damage. Ours wound up costing over $200,000 in legal fees. And even though our insurance covered part of it, and we were lucky that HBO stood by us, this lawsuit was infuriating, took up a lot of time and resources, and resulted in a tripling of our libel insurance premiums. <laughs> despite the fact that, to reiterate, we won this case. <laughs> look, look, here's the thing. We badly need effective anti-slap laws nationwide to deter powerful people like Bob Murray from using the courts to shut down people's legitimate dissent. So yeah, I mean, fortunately for John Oliver, he had incredible resources and he already had a media liability policy, which most people in media keep. Um, and that's that's a good thing, but it still can be very damaging, especially to small newspapers and, and smaller organizations because they still won't have as much of a media liability policy as something like HBO. Um, and even then, I mean, that costs them crazy amounts of resources. That's no drop in the pan. And this is the kind of thing that ultimately you know, it makes people second think before they talk, right? It makes a lot of people be really hesitant to call out the truth, to speak truth to power, to report on bad information around powerful people. These are really, really detrimental things. So this is why I'm a huge proponent of a federal anti-slap law. I think it's something that we need to get implemented sooner rather than later. This is something that you can talk to your senator or congressman about, and it should be something that's a bipartisan effort we can come together on. Well, something you might want to talk to your representatives about is uh, inflation and the absolutely unhinged and dishonest messaging coming out of the Biden White House about it. I want to roll this moment from White House Karine, uh, White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre, uh, who, you know, to be fair to her, the job of a White House Press Secretary is kind of to gaslight uh, the American public and just like deny obvious bad things. But She's really taken it to a whole new extreme. Take a look at this. Why this president has been so zeroed in, so laser focused on lowering costs for Americans. And we've done that. And a lot of the a lot of the policies that the president has put forward are indeed popular. I mean, Bidenomics is has worked so well that you have Republicans in their own districts, in their own states, taking credit for things that the president pushed forward, policies that the president has pushed forward, legislation that they didn't even vote for. If you think about the American Rescue Plan, the Inflation Reduction Act. So I get I get the I get the polling that you're laying out. So, Hannah, lowered costs for Americans under the Biden administration. Does that sound correct to you? It doesn't sound correct to me at all. I'm like, you can gaslight people about a lot of things. They might not be up on policy enough to push back. But when it comes to whether or not things have gotten more expensive and how they're doing economically, nobody's that stupid. Everybody knows things have become drastically more expensive over the past couple of years. People are hurting. This is the topic of conversation all over any social media platform, particularly ones like TikTok, where you have younger people. And they might not understand exactly the policies that got put into place to get us there, but they certainly know things have not gotten cheaper. Gas is still 
crazy high. Prices are still going up. Inflation is still going up each month. That does not mean that the prices are coming down. They've slowed inflation slightly, but they also were responsible for it skyrocketing in the first place. So this is just completely backwards. And it honestly really annoyed me at the end where she tried to take a dig at Republicans for not supporting their stupid Trojan horse socialist climate change agenda inflation reduction act package like as if that was ever going to do anything to help with inflation at all and then to try to dig at republicans for seeing through it and not supporting it what in the world i know it, the inflation reduction act is one of the most misleadingly named pieces of legislation of all time because it had absolutely nothing to do with inflation and even like bernie sanders who voted for it admitted that uh it was climate change subsidies more funding for the irs and a couple other unrelated policies and they just wanted to pass it get it passed so they put inflation reduction act on it which i still think is one of the most offensive things this administration has done it's bad enough that their policies have contributed to the inflation that's bankrupted american families and really put many through a tough time who can't afford it to then kind of slap them in the face by putting telling them you're passing an inflation reduction act when you're really just cramming through your partisan agenda that you've tried to pass before and couldn't get through and just slapping an inflation label on it it's really insulting to their intelligence and to just so blatantly disregard their actual concerns but more importantly it's just simply factually untrue to claim to claim that prices have been reduced under joe biden so as of september 2023 Prices were up by the following amount since Biden took office. This is all according to data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So it's government data. Uh, groceries are up 20%. Food away from home is up 18.5%. Energy costs are up 43%. Gas prices are up 62.5%. Electricity is up 26%. Used cars and trucks are up 33%. You get the idea. It is so interesting that that is government data, and yet she can't seem to get it in front of her. I mean, honestly, it's just embarrassing. And it's interesting because it's not just Republicans that are calling this out. The Washington Post actually recently reported that despite Biden's touted success at lowering costs, many Americans still feel the stain of high costs for the basics. And even as inflation eases, prices are not expected to return to levels before the pandemic. Also, you have USA Today similarly reporting in August. Extreme heat is forcing Americans to choose between food and air conditioning this summer. But what? <laughs> <laughs> this is some third world stuff. I mean, honestly, that's that's really bleak. And I think I have been very fortunate during these times. Everything's been going very smoothly on work on my end. But I, I know a lot of people who are saying this and they're not, you know, they're people who are making decent money and they're saying, I'm making more money than I've ever been making before in my life. And yet I have less disposable income. I feel like I live more paycheck to paycheck. I'm more strapped for cash. I see people saying I was better off five years ago when I was making 50000 versus today when I'm making 90000 This is extreme. This is really, really serious stuff. And I think that there's, it's not just the Biden White House gaslighting. It's, it's been a lot of the media. It's the fact that they've kept the stock market pretty inflated and it's not really had a bust and come down significantly. You have like the head of the Fed recently saying they see no signs of a recession. And so I think it's very discombobulating to a lot of Americans to consistently be told everything's fine, everything's great, the economy's doing swell. And meanwhile, they recognize, I, but I have less money, I have less freedom, I'm not able to keep up, I'm feeling strapped. And I can't, I think that must be a really confusing and infuriating position to be in when you don't understand what's actually going on beneath the surface and you don't have a good handle on the policies that have been passed and implemented since 2020 in order to understand what's really going on. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And it's so bad now that even the mainstream media, like you read from WAPO and USA Today, are admitting just how terrible it is. <laughs> when for a while, the mainstream media was doing this like, well, inflation is because of Putin or inflation is because of corporate greed or other narratives that are not really correct. Now, I, I want to be clear that like Biden isn't 100 percent responsible for inflation. He's not 100 percent responsible for the price of, of used cars. His policies have worsened a lot of these problems. You know, his anti-energy policies have contributed to higher gas prices and which actually leads to higher prices throughout the economy because basically everything is dependent on transportation costs. 
uh, his massive, wasteful, fraud-rife stimulus bill, the American Rescue Plan, uh, basically ran the money printer for an extra trillion and a half or whatever, I think almost two trillion dollars. The Inflation Reduction Act is turning out to cost way more than we expected. So instead of reducing the deficit, it's further adding to the deficit. That money essentially gets printed or borrowed. Um, and so it further worsens inflation. So I don't want to like make it sound like Biden is 100% to blame for all of this, but he is partially to blame for it. I mean, obviously the economy is complex. Global factors play a, a role. Lots of things play a role. And then it, the goal really is to just claim that he's reduced prices is just, and I don't want you to think this is just one clip of Karine Jean-Pierre taken out of context either. They push this messaging constantly. And they even argue that they are lowering costs and then they show inflation having come down from 9% to 3%. But what folks need to realize about that is some data literacy that the White House thinks you are too stupid to comprehend, but you're not, is that inflation is the rate of change or the inflation rate we talk about is the rate of change on an annualized basis of consumer prices. So when we had 9% inflation, that meant that inflation was increasing at a month-to-month -month rate that if you factored it across a year, would be 9%. So prices would go up by that much over a year. Now, inflation has fallen to 3% or so, 3 or 4%. That means prices are still going up. Prices have not decreased. They're not reverting. That would be deflation. They're still going up. Just the rate at which they are increasing has slowed. So you're still getting poorer. Things are still getting more expensive. And all the damage that was done is still with us. It hasn't been undone in any way. That would require deflation. And yet they're claiming things are more affordable, or they always say they're giving Americans breathing room. And it's like, no, you're just suffocating us slightly less, well, significantly slower. And I, I, I just hope people can understand like that basic economic literacy, because I don't blame people who don't aren't familiar with these things but they're counting on your ignorance to get away with their lies and misperceptions. That's right. And I see you have in the document noted here, guys, overall consumer prices have increased 17.4% under Biden. That is crazy. That is a lot. It is it is stifling. Something has to give here. And you're right. It's not just Biden. Republicans deserve a ton of blame for this as well. They were also participating in many of the stimulus and COVID policies. They did not cut spending at any point when they were in the position to do so. And ultimately, the Federal Reserve and its money printing is what has really led to this. Something has to give. People like Ron Paul have been trying to raise the alarm on the debt, on the spending, and on the printing for over two decades now. This has been a point of conversation. And it's one where I feel like it's it's almost just treated like laughable on the left, right? When you start talking about the debt, they're like, oh, the debt, like who cares? They, I mean, they really do have that attitude. And you see many people saying like, just spend it. We have it. We spend money on this, just spend this. We don't have it. We are grossly in debt. And if you think that those numbers don't matter, the chickens are going to come home to roost and it's going to be too late to turn the ship around. There's been people like Rand Paul trying to do the very basic adult governing in the room needed to get the situation under control what was his thing of not long ago a penny plan right it was just like cutting even like the smallest amounts across the the span i think of it was like one spending. cent out of the dollar a year for five years or something and they wouldn't even pass something like that yeah they they refused to have a serious conversation about this and so don't say there weren't canaries in the coal mine when it comes crashing down on your head and it's going to it's going to keep getting worse your dollar is going to become worth less and less you're not going to be able to afford basic things your quality of life is going to go down we're not just ranting and raving about this because we're a bunch of nerds the, the writing is on the wall with this so i'm i i hope people do start to see through it i hope they you know just really get a grip on reality and understand that you cannot keep acting like this without consequences it's it's going to get really bad well, we also have a canary in the coal mine about our education system because one TikToker is speaking out that things are just not going great. Hannah, uh, let's take a look at that TikTok. Let's take a moment to unpack. So I'm not really understanding why they're not telling y'all. Like, we all know that the world is behind, like, you know, globally, like, you know, because of the pandemic and stuff. But I don't understand why they're not stressing to y'all how bad it is. Like, I'm not even trying to be funny, but these kids are... I'm going to just say this. 
I teach seventh grade, they are still performing on the fourth grade level. I don't care how you flip it, turn it, swing it, swing it, swindle it. They still performing on the fourth grade level. Ain't nobody talking about how they just keep moving, passing them on. They just keep passing them on, 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 passing them on. I can put as many zeros in this grade book as I want to. They gonna move that child to the eighth grade next year. But ain't nobody talking about that. Why they not talking about that? Why they not telling y'all that y'all... And why don't y'all know that y'all kids not performing on their grade level? Why y'all don't know this? Why y'all don't know? Talk about it. Let's unpack. Because y'all be quick to talk about, oh, the teacher this, the teacher this, the teacher. It's your job, it's your job, baby. I just got here 30 days ago. She was performing on the fourth grade level since fourth grade. So, Brad, this video has gone viral, not only on TikTok, but also on Twitter. And one of the reasons it's going viral is not just because of the content. It's because so many other teachers are stitching it. That's how you basically, um, guys, if you're not TikTok, you can take a video and, like, respond to it, essentially. So many other teachers are stitching this with their own experiences and validating what he is experiencing. Anecdotally, my sister-in-law is a teacher at a private school in Alabama. She told me the exact same thing last week, that the kids just get worse and worse each year as far as where they're at. And she teaches first grades. So we're talking really young kids um, developmentally, and it just gets worse and worse since the pandemic. But this year, she said, is the worst by far. They are just not coming in with the basic skill sets or abilities that you would expect kids to be at at their grade levels. And this is something that was so predictable and predicted throughout the pandemic as the teachers unions and Fauci and co were working to shut down schools needlessly. There were many, many people, us included, who consistently said this is one, not worth it. There's not a serious threat to kids in these schools. But secondarily, the amount that you are going to put kids behind if you do this is going to be significant. It's going to be felt for decades in this country. And it is, of course, going to hurt kids who are already living on the margins the most and the data is in i mean this is this guy's experience he teaches public schools in atlanta it appears based on the TikTok. um but i found some national data they say that math reading and history scores from the past three years show that students learned far less during the pandemic than was typical and by the spring of 2022 the average student was half a year behind in math and a third of a year behind in reading um, the detailed geographic data revealed what national tests do not, which is that the pandemic exasperated economic and racial educational inequality. They found that the pandemic left students in low income and predominantly minority communities even further behind their peers and richer, wider districts than they were before. And it was already pretty bad before. And lastly, they say in the hardest hit communities where students fell behind by more than one and a half years in math, schools would have to teach 150 percent of a typical year's worth of material for three years in a row just to catch up this is dire these are these are people that we need to be able to come out and be doctors and nurses and engineers and we are not going to have the workforce that we need in very short order if this if something doesn't happen to rectify this yeah you know you're absolutely right and and i will just say like to dispense with the euphemisms a little bit it's not really the pandemic that did this although when people say the pandemic they're referring to policies as well but i just want to be crystal clear there's nothing about COVID existing or spreading that made kids inherently need to fall behind in schools. In some European countries, they never close schools or they close them only briefly and then reopen them. Uh, some Catholic private schools never closed during the pandemic. And you can look and their data just didn't change. Whereas what we're going to see now in every graph of education data is a huge divot. And maybe it will go back up or maybe it will flatline and like be at a, a just a decreased norm now. But you're going to see 2020 and 2021 that data just starkly diverge because you can't take kids out of school for in some places like a year and a half or give go to this remote education that was a complete disaster and then not expected to have lifelong ramifications. I mean, McKinsey has done analysis about this how this will impact kids uh, lifetime earnings and you're talking huge amounts of money uh, that they will not earn over their lifetimes from less academic achievement but i think just honestly you know i don't blame people too much who initially closed schools in in like spring summer 2020 right because a lot of unknowns were there and so the idea that they were scared they were being cautious they didn't know if schools would be big vectors for transmission and they'd go home and get their grandpa sick and kill them. It turned out very quickly, though, after those few months, we could look at European schools that didn't close and we could see, OK, they're not big vectors. It's not an issue. 
And yet the entire next school year and then a little bit even into the school year that followed that throughout 2021, tons of schools across the country were closed or they had like hybrid or remote or other things. And it just was never really well substantiated by any sort of public health or scientific analysis. It was always mostly rooted in fear and the teachers unions lobbying heavily against reopening, fighting tooth and nail to not have to go back to work and do their jobs. Uh, when to me, that was always crazy. We expected the people stocking the grocery stores to keep going to work. They were essential workers. Well, teachers are essential workers. And I would have been happy to uh, see us make accommodations for teachers who like have an autoimmune disease or are really old or like some are for some reason particularly vulnerable. But just by and large, they abdicated their duty, local governments and school boards and teachers unions and everyone else that did this. They failed our kids. And there's going to be lifelong ramifications from it. And it's really, really disheartening. I feel bad for the teachers who are in schools who have these students who are so far behind because, you know, like this random teacher, I'm sure wasn't involved in the decision to open or close schools, but he's dealing with the consequences, which is his students are three years behind. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it is important to remember, too, unions shut down the schools for reasons that had a lot less to do with the pandemic and a lot more to do with their political grab bag. We had unions that were trying to keep schools shut down so they could get things like defund the police passed or they could get universal health care in their state. I mean, there was really- Guys, that sounds made up. That's a real thing. They literally had demands that included Medicare for all and defund the police, some of these teachers unions. That sounds like it's it's like a Breitbart story that's not real or something. It's 100% real. It's facts. You can look it up. But- it was atrocious what they did. It was corrupt. It was disgusting. And again, kids are going to be the ones that pay the price for this. I do appreciate what this teacher said, though, about how we're so quick to blame the teachers. Uh, even parents are quick to blame the teachers. And this is a problem I have with the public school system. I think it to some people, to some families, sort of says you don't have to be involved in your education of your child. You can just hand them off to the government and everything will be great. No, it won't. <laughs> you need to be involved in your kid's education no matter where they're in school. But especially if they're in public school, you need to be paying attention to what they're being taught. You need to be countering a good bit of what they're being taught. And you should be engaged enough in your kid's educational progress to know if they are not keeping up by grade. I mean, the fact that he's saying they're just rolling these kids over from one grade to the next, even if they have terrible grades. My mom taught in the public school system for a couple of years, um, and she had a terrible experience with it and experienced this, where essentially they were telling her she had to give kids good enough grades to pass them, good enough grades for them to play sports. And she was aghast at that. She really was there to educate and wanted to do the right thing. And she ultimately quit over it. She had the financial position to be able to do that. A lot of teachers don't. And so they are being told to participate in this kind of really corrupt system. There's things like No Kid Left Behind, which was a terrible education package passed under George W. Bush that are responsible for some of these policies and essentially saying that schools, you know, it hurts their funding if they have a certain amount of kids that are not moving up grade by grade. So instead of that actually meaning that they do a better job of educating the kids, they just keep rolling them up, even if they're illiterate. And so you end up with this system where people, Americans are graduating high school and they are on third grade reading levels. It, it's atrocious. It's You can't have a sustainable country with people that lack these fundamental educational foundations. And I mean, guys, there are some that are going to say this is a, a money issue. This is why we need to fund the schools better. Cut the crap. They got $190 billion extra dollars during COVID. They were already spending $15,000 per kid per year on average, meaning some districts are spending far more than that even before the pandemic. That is double the cost of most private schools down here in the South. And yet we are still getting this crud. It is inexcusable. It is not a funding problem. The government is not capable, I think, of running schools in a way that is going to produce the outcomes that we need. And this is why school choice is imperative. We've got to get these kids out of these failing schools and give them a shot to catch up. And parents have got to become more involved. You have to be doing your due diligence on this. It's not fair to expect a teacher within one year to be able to come in and do all this catch up and rectify all of these things in your kid's progression. Yeah, I, I agree. And it's really not about funding. So let, I want to read you a couple of shocking statistics. This is about Baltimore now in Maryland. Quote, at Baltimore's five best high schools, 11% of students were proficient in math at the five best high schools. And now this is not a funding issue because Baltimore schools are the fourth most funded large school system in America. I mean, if that doesn't tell you we need systemic change in the education system, I don't know what will. 
if we have testimonies like this from teachers, we have hard data, we have this the solutions that progressives advocate for clearly not working. I mean, I don't know. If you don't support school choice after this, what do we have to lose, really, by trying to give people more options? What do we have to lose? The status quo is completely untenable. Yeah, something's got to give. All right. Well, let's move on to our hot takes. Brad, what do you have this week? My hot take is that cauliflower is gross. And it, for whatever reason, just it, it tastes funky. It has no taste, but then it just kind of like is mushy. And in any, basically any situation or recipe, broccoli is superior to cauliflower. So just stop. Stop putting this white looking crusty ass vegetable on my plate. I don't want to eat it. I'm just going to eat around it. Keep it away from me. I don't want it. I could eat cauliflower at every meal. I love cauliflower. And it's like, it's the healthy version of a potato. You can make anything with cauliflower. It's like chalk. It tastes like chalk. You need to season your food, you Yankee. Put some butter <laughs> and salt on it. <laughs> I do. And then it just tastes like buttery chalk. Uh, I don't know. I think something's up your taste buds on that one. All right. My hot take is that, believe it or not, men were worse in the 90s than they are today. And I have come upon this um, discovery after this weekend. I watched some 90s movies. Um, I was, long story short, listening to this podcast. and It was talking about Fatal Attraction and another one um, with Demi Moore that's called, oh, An Indecent Proposal. So I ended up watching them back to back because I was interested in the like social commentary they both provided. And the premises of both were absolutely unhinged, right? And one, you have a man that's literally like selling his wife to sleep with a billionaire because he's so broke he can't like make their house payments and this is just okay right and she's like presented as the bad guy no. for doing this and yeah and i'm like oh, in what world go drive a taxi flip burgers you don't sell your wife what and then the second one it was this man who appeared to be in a very happy normal marriage with a kid who just decided to have an affair one weekend just you know for fun i guess and then the woman was crazy and tried to kill him. And I think you're supposed to be rooting for him, but I was not. I was like, kill him. I hope she does get him. Like, this guy sucks. <laughs> and after all of that, I was really thinking about 90s movies and the main characters that are male in them. And I'm like, these men were awful. So I think men are improving, actually, all things considered. Well, that's saying something. It is. <laughs> all right, guys, that's a wrap. Hope you liked the episode. Leave us a comment, subscribe to the channel, and until next week, stay based.